Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome to another episode in looking at the life of the Prophet Isa, peace be upon him, better known to Christians as Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. And we looked in the episodes before this at why Christians claim that Jesus Christ is God. Now we looked through the Bible and I showed you verses of how Christians claim that Jesus is God because he claimed to be the Son of God. How Jesus is God because he was the only begotten Son. And how Jesus is God because he was born without a father. And Jesus is God because he is calling his creator, he calls Allah, Father. So therefore he must be God. And we looked at how he has to be God because he received worship and how he has to be God because he called God Lord and God because he allowed people to call him Lord and God. And we saw that all of these points were easy to explain, easy to explain away. That these were just sayings that were quite common amongst many other people at the same time, that many other them were called Lord, many of the people were referred to as gods. And this no way means that he was somehow co-equal to God or that he should receive veneration in any way. We also looked at the last episode is that Christians claim that Jesus is God because he was pre-existent. And we know that this seems to be, at the face of it, quite a difficult one to answer. How do you answer the fact that Jesus or the Bible claims that Jesus pre-existed? Well, if we look at other books in the, in the Bible, if we look at Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, it is quite clear that Jeremiah says that he pre-existed before he existed. Now, does that mean that Jeremiah is God? Does that mean that he is equal to God? Does that mean that he is somehow part of the Trinity, somehow part of the Godhead? No, because Christians have looked at this verse and say that you cannot take this verse literally. It's not a literal. But when it comes to looking at John chapter 8 of the New Testament and verse 58, they say that when Jesus said, before Abraham was, I was, that proves that somehow he is God. But yet you can't apply that same rule when we go back to the Old Testament to Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5. How can you do the one to the one and not to the other? It's simple mathematics. Whatever you do to the top, you must do to the bottom. Whatever you do to the left, you do to the right. It's simple. But when it comes to theology, nothing is ever simple, especially when it comes to trying to create a doctrine that was never written, to try and create a doctrine that doesn't exist. You have to have a tough time trying to make these two rules separate. You know, don't do as I do, do as I say. We often do that as parents or we say, don't do this to our kids, and then they do the thing, and we complain that we actually do it ourselves. We complain when they do it, but we do it ourselves. And so we don't want to be like that. We are Muslims, and we are consistent. We, if we apply a rule to the left, we apply it to the right. If it exists in the Old Testament, surely the same rules should apply in the New Testament. So if Jesus lived in heaven and then came to earth, that might mean something remarkable, as I said in previous episodes. But it does not do enough to establish that he is... God. It is not enough to establish him as a supernatural being. All it is is phenomenal. It's amazing. If that is true and that is exactly what happened, well that's amazing. Because he existed in a pre-human form or pre-existed before, that he's somehow God. Now for Muslim this is actually even easier than this to explain. For us we know about predestination. This is pre-existence, predestination. We all existed before Adam existed. We all existed before Abraham existed. We all existed before the prophet Isa peace be upon him existed. We all existed before, before. Because our whole lives have been written. Our whole story is already completed. Our book is already on the shelf. Our life has been completely written out long before we even thought of or before we were even born. Because Allah Ta'ala is in charge of everything. So for us the statement is that, that someone would make that Therefore, John or Michael or Shaheen is God because he pre-existed. This is not a problem for us because we know we all pre-existed. Our information, our data pre-exists long before we are actually born. So we don't have a problem with that. However, no such similarity or understanding or, or comprehension exists within Christianity. Even though I must admit there are some Christians who understand the, the concept of predestination, but they do not understand it in the same way we do. They take it to a certain point and no further because they know that if predestination exists, they have a fatalistic understanding of it from the Bible. You see, for a Christian, predestination means I give up. I can't do anything, I just give up. I'm predestination to be a bad guy and so I don't even try. So 
they're scared of that because it might bring the numbers down in the church and if you may be also predestined not to give money to the church that month. So it can be a bad thing for finances for the church. So predestination amongst Christians is not so popular. But for us as Muslims, it's part of our faith. We understand this. This is a, a tenant of our faith. So however, no such understanding is permitted within the church. And so with John 8, 58, they don't apply the same rule as they apply to the Old Testament. So I hope that it clarifies that and it explains that to you. So now we move on to point number nine. And point number nine is like a natural progression, a natural flow from point number eight. Because in point number nine, it says the Christian will say, Jesus is God because he claimed before Abraham was, I am. Which is more or less what we spoke about in the section before this. However, there is a difference. In Exodus chapter three, when we need to look at this, so you need to get your Bible, you need to mark these things, you need to take notes. No good just sitting there and letting this go over your head. You need to get it, make sure it sinks into your head so you can tell the missionary, you can tell the Christian, you can tell the evangelist when he comes exactly uh, what we've been talking about and ask him to try and explain this in a logical way that makes any sense to you. And he will not be able to because this is all made up stuff. This is not stuff that he's getting out of the Bible. This is doctrine that he brought outside of the Bible into the Bible. So in Exodus chapter 3, the second book of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus chapter 3, it is reported that God told Moses, I am what I am, as most English versions of the Bible translate it. So Moses is, says, who must I say sent me? And he says, I am sent you, or I am who I am sent me. So I am is a word that is used. Now the Hebrews understand this word I am to mean God. And so the word I am is very, very sacred word within the Jewish community. You don't just use it, you can't end a sentence with I am. It's very, very important to the people not to use that word. So the Jewish people that read this text immediately knew that all you needed to say is I am, because I am meant God. So when we go to John chapter 8, verse 58, Jesus says, before Abraham was I am, as most English Bible translated from the Greek. So you have in the one text in the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 5, where we just read it says, and Moses was said, who must say it? Who sent you? He said, I am has sent you. And so this is what we find in the Hebrew text. But did you hear that in the New Testament, that's the Greek text, Hebrew text, Greek text. There's a difference. They're both using I am. But here's the key to another deception that the Christian missionary is using or the Christian clergyman or the priest is using. The original of the first text is in Hebrew and the original in the second text is in Greek. Not the same text because one is choosing from the one and one is choosing from the other. They're purposely choosing different texts, different translations to translate this from. All but a few of Jesus' words are recorded in Greek. All but a few of Jesus' words are found in the Greek text. So I don't want to lose you in this text that I'm speaking about now. You have the Old Testament and the New Testament. You have two different translations being used, two different languages being used. And we're looking at the word I am because that's a very, very important word. You see, for the Jew, I am means God, hands down. There is no debate on it, it means God. So let's have a look there. For 200 years before the time of Jesus, the Jews used the Greek translation of the Hebrew Septuagint, or the Hebrew scriptures called the Septuagint. Now, this work translated the key phrase, I am, the word I am, of Exodus as, we just looked now in the book of Exodus, as if I had to use the correct translation of the Hebrew as it was written, that would be ho-on. However, the words of Jesus, I am, have been given in Greek as ego imi. So ho-on and ego imi, do they sound anything the same? Do they even remotely look like they belong to each other? Ho-on is a translation, and the other one is ego imi. So you can see there are totally different words, totally different strings of sentences put together purposely to deceive you, purposely to deceive the Christian, purposely to deceive anybody who picks up this book. So if the Gospel writer of John chapter 8, verse 58, wanted to tell us, or the Greek-speaking audience, that Jesus was God, he would have used a familiar words of the Septuagint. He would have used words that the people at that time knew. So this is a purposely done deception. There's two different words. They do not mean the same thing. They do not mean I am. They mean I am representative, I am sent of. They don't mean I am. They do not mean I am God. So this is a deception purposely done to deceive people. So now whenever we look at a translation, we must always go back to the root form. That's why we as Muslims, we have a Arabic on the one side and the translation. The translation is never going to be perfect. That's why we always go back to the 
Arabic. We go back to the original. And like I said in previous episodes, some of the Christians have got very clever in what they do now. They have a Hebrew-English translation. So they have on the one side the Hebrew, on the other side they have the translation. But the whole Bible was not written in Hebrew. This is a translation of a translation of a translation. So they still don't have the original. So don't be fooled. Don't think that they have the original because they've got the two next to each other. That means nothing. It's translated from the translation into Hebrew and then from Hebrew back into the translation. That's, that's crazy. So we're not doing that. We're not following that. We didn't have the English and then translated into Arabic and then back into the English to try and make people think that this is the original text. So let's move on to the next point. The next point that Christians bring up is point number 10. And point number 10 is that Jesus had to be God because he had the power to forgive sins. Now, having the power to forgive sins has to mean that Jesus is God. Every point we've got to, it seems like this is the most convincing argument. And this looks pretty much like a good argument. Because if anybody has the power to forgive sins, you ask forgiveness and I forgive you, surely that means I'm divine. Surely that means I have supernatural powers uh, and beyond normal human. Now, supernatural, when you use the word supernatural, sometimes people get the idea of witchcraft or, or wizardry or sorcery or people dealing with the jinn. But supernatural means that it was beyond human power. This is something alien. So in Mark chapter 2, the second chapter of Mark, in the Bible, we have to look to see where they get this doctrine or this belief from. And Jesus tells a man in Mark chapter 2 and verse 5 to 10, it's quite a long section, but I'm just going to summarize it. You can read it at your own leisure. He says, your sins are forgiven. Jesus says to the man, your sins are forgiven. The fact that Jesus forgives sins is perhaps an action that Jesus is most commonly heard or, or spoken about doing amongst Christians. And amongst Christian people, they will say, yeah, all you have to do is accept Jesus and your sins will be forgiven. So this is the main denominator, the main synopsis, the main doctrine within Christian theology. They build everything around this and this is the main just of Christianity. So looking at this concept of whether Jesus has the power to forgive sin and that automatically makes him God is a question that we will answer after we get back from this short break. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. We are continuing our study on the personality of Jesus Christ, or the Prophet Isa, peace be upon him, as understood by the Christians. Now remember when they come to your house, or they, you meet them on the street, or they give you information or pamphlets, you'll be able to answer these fundamental questions on what they understand about the Prophet Isa, peace be upon him, and what we as Muslims understand to be the truth. And so we have got to point 10 of our study, our 15 points, and we have seen that Christians will claim that Jesus is God because he had the power to forgive sins. So this has to be a pretty strong point for them. Because if you think about it, who has the right to forgive sins? As Muslims, we know that the only one that has the right to forgive sins is Allah. And one of the beautiful things about the Quran is in the Quran it says, Allah is oft forgiving, most merciful. And I have counted 72 times in the Quran where Allah is described as oft forgiving, most merciful. And in my study of the Bible, I found there are two times where it says, a God is off forgiving, most merciful. So as far as sin is concerned, the Quran, we find it 70 times more than we find it in, in the Bible. Now, going back to the point of the power of forgiving sins. Now, when we look at the statement, we find that in John chapter 12 and verse 49, it says, amongst other things, Jesus says to his disciples that he will give them power to forgive sins, whoever asks for forgiveness of sins. So now we suddenly find that the disciples of Jesus, who are around at the same time, he gives them authority to forgive sins, and apparently grants his disciples this supernatural strength and supernatural power. If that is so, then surely they also have the right to join the Trinity, because in the same way, they would then be, they have the same power as God, the same authority as God, and be God themselves. And so this doesn't make any sense. So this is another one of those difficult statements that Christians cannot answer. If the disciples have the power to forgive sins and they have the same authority as God, does that not make them automatically God? No, it doesn't. So there's a problem. Either there's a textual error here or there's a theological error. So the Christian cannot say that there's a textual error, so there has to be a theological error. And the theological error is forgiveness of sin does no way mean that you are thus God or that you are equal to God or you have the same authority or power as God. Now, those of you who may know the Catholic Church will know that many Catholics ask for forgiveness of sin, but they do it through a priest. 
So what a Catholic will do is he will go to church and he will go at a special time of the day or a special time of the week and he'll go to a confession box. It's two little rooms in front of the church and you'll sit in the confession box and the other side of the confession box will be a man, a human being, born of a normal mother, a normal father, went through normal childhood, did good and bad deeds, and he will sit in the confession box. And in the confession box, we will go, if you're a Catholic, and you'll say, Father, forgive me for I have sinned. And you will confess your sins to this man who is referred to as a father. And this father, this man who's referred to as a father, will say at the end of it, your sins are forgiven. So, does that mean that every priest and every Catholic church throughout the world is also God? And they also belong to the Godhead and they should also join the Trinity? And if you've been watching the series from the beginning, the, the previous uh, episodes, we've seen that just because these statements are made doesn't mean that you're necessarily God. So if these statements are true and we have to follow them strictly according to the Bible, according to the Christians, I should say, more correctly to what the Christians say, what Christian doctrine says, the, the Trinity is already now moving up into the thousands. So we have thousands and thousands and thousands of people and thousands of beings that have past and present and future that should now be part of the Trinity. So the Trinity is becoming overcrowded. And that's more or less where Mormonism gets its idea from, that we're all somehow one day all going to be gods and have our own planet. And this is totally ridiculous. This has got no basis in any of the scriptures. This is not a pattern that we find anywhere in the Old Testament, New Testament, and definitely do not find in the Quran. These are doctrines that are external, where people bring them and try to force them into the Bible or try to force them into even into uh, other religious documents and other religious books. So let's move on now to point number 11. The 11th point that Christians will often raise or often say to you to continue this line of Jesus being God is they'll say that Jesus is God because he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now this is one of my favorite verses of the Bible. Now this might shock you thinking I'm Muslim and I have a favorite verse of the Bible. This is probably the most phenomenal verse that you will find in the Bible because it is the clearest evidence that Jesus is not God. Now for a Christian, this is the clearest evidence that Jesus is God. So if we look at the verse, I am the way, the truth, and the life, as found in the Bible, it says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father, in other words, no one comes to Allah, no one comes to God, but through me. This is found in John chapter 14, verse 6. This you must write in big letters and keep it in your house, put it somewhere, make sure that everybody who comes into your house that's not a Muslim reads it. So you put it there, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to Allah, no one comes to God, no one comes to the Father, but through me. Who's me? Through Jesus, he's talking about himself. So the statement, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to Allah but by me, can be applied to all the prophets, as I said. You can have a look at all the prophets, you can choose any other one of them, and you can insert them into the appropriate line. So you can say, I am the way, the truth, and the law, says Abraham. Because everyone who followed the teachings of Abraham before that, he was the way, he was the truth, he was the light, he was the life, he was the guidance, he was the director, he was the helper, he was the one showing you to Allah. And there is no other door that you could possibly have entered through except through the covenant, the teachings, the laws that he gave. So this can be used for any prophet, any prophet at all, peace be upon them all. Because they were all the way, they were all the truth, they were all the life givers, and no one could possibly find their way to God but through them. So this is not unique. This doesn't mean that now that uh, just because the, the Jesus said this or that just because the prophet Isa, peace be upon him, said this, that this somehow proves that he is God. You see, Muslims, we have no problem with this verse. We're actually quite happy with this verse because it is true, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God but by me. This is something we understand. As Muslims, we know that the day we die, we are going to lie in our graves. We're going to have our salah done for us. Someone's going to pray for us, and we're going to be laid into our graves. And when we're laid in our grave, we're going to be asked three questions. And one of those questions is, who was your way? And you'll have to answer, who was your way? And the right answer today would be the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But 2,000 years ago, it would have been Isa, peace be upon him. So the answer was right 2,000 years ago. I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to Allah but by my teachings. So we have no problems with that. That is 100% correct. But that's not the way the Christians understand it. Let me give you this analogy quickly. If you have an entrance to your home, 
the door that you have to come through, that you, put, you have to put your key in to open the door, is that door your house? No, you would know that's not your house. The door is simply a door. It's probably the last thing that was added onto the house. The house is totally separate to the door. You can change the door whenever you want to. Some people like a fancy door, some people like a plain door, some people like a stable door with the top and the bottom open separately. The door can be changed. The house remains the same. So when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me, that's true. Because he is just the door. He is not the building. He is just the door, the entrance. And so all the prophets are the same. They are not God. So it's very easy for us to understand that. Now the Christian, the exactly what this verse is supposed to mean to him is very vague. For the Christian, does this mean that this verse proves the divinity of Jesus? Or is it that it's supposed to mean that God listens only to Jesus and nobody else, which is number two? Or three, does it mean that only those who call on Jesus, God listens to? So which one is it? We don't know because not even Christians themselves know. From one Christian to the next, they will differ on the opinions on what this text is supposed to mean. But we as Muslims have no problem with it because we understand it quite easily. Allah says there's only one way and that is through the teachings of the Prophet that was sent. The Prophet that was sent 2,000 years ago was the Prophet Isa, peace be upon him. And his message is over. Now the Prophet that was sent for our man, for this generation and for the generation to come is the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And we follow those teachings without a problem. So this has been a very interesting episode and we look forward to many more exciting episodes regarding the divinity, the person, the character of Jesus Christ as found in the Bible. And in the future episodes, we will look at the last three or four or five um, characteristics Christian use to try and explain that this is why we believe Jesus is God. Now we've been through, we passed the halfway mark, we've gone through two thirds of this information already, and we found that none of these verses in any way whatsoever prove that Jesus is God. They only prove that he was a great prophet, they prove that he was a great messenger, we have reverence and respect for the, the personality of Jesus Christ, we, we, we hold him highly and uh, esteemed in, in Islam, and we as Muslims have all the respect for him. We do not attack, we're not attacking the, the character or the personality of the Prophet Isa, peace be upon him. We're attacking those who have interpreted the scripture wrong. Those who have tried to come to the scripture of the Bible and put their own ideas into it. And so in the episodes to come, inshallah, we will be able to have a look at the truth and the real personality of the Prophet Isa, peace be upon him. Thank you for watching and we look forward to seeing you again. Assalamu alaikum. Mm-hmm.